Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's uh, Ahmed Salam here from the University of Arkansas, and it's my pleasure uh, to uh, present this webinar with my colleagues for the Afro-Asian Council of Ophthalmology. Um, Dr. Tari Hamam from the Dr. Tari Hamam from the Afro-Asian uh, Council of Ophthalmology, the secretary was uh, meant to join us, but unfortunately, due to family reasons, he could not. But uh, let's get started, and I would like to welcome my guest uh, speakers um for this webinar uh, starting with professor uh, sue lightman um uh, professor sue lightman is a professor of ophthalmology with uh, interest in uveitis from the university college of london and morpheus um, eye hospital uh, she's very well renowned and uh, i'm uh, very uh, grateful i'm very proud to say that i did my uveitis fellowship with her sue thank you so much for joining us Um, and then uh, next speaker uh, is Dr. Armando Oliver from uh, the University uh, for School of Medicine of Puerto Rico. And Dr. Oliver is Associate Professor of Uveitis, and he's also a vitro retinal surgeon. Uh, Armando, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ahmed. Right. And uh, last but not least uh, is Dr. Rola Hammam uh, from the American University uh, of Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, Dr. Hammam is Associate Professor uh, of ophthalmology, and she's the UVITAS uh, service director, and she's also the program director uh, of the program. Uh, Rola, thank you so much for joining us today from Lebanon. I know it's already late there. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Pleasure right. to be with you. And without further ado, we'll start with uh, Dr. Rola Hamem, and she's speaking to us about, she's showing us cases, uh, and uh, let's see what uh, she's showing us. Rola, let me just stop sharing. Okay, I'm gonna share with you two uh, cases of uh, uh, infectious uh, uveitis, as you asked me. Uh, the first case is uh, a 65-year-old uh, male uh, who presented to us with a left frontal uh, headache and blurring of vision uh, in the left eye of 17 days duration. His uh, past medical history uh, was positive for hyperlipidemia and diabetes for which he was on treatment and he was status post nephrectomy for nephrolithiasis years prior to his presentation to us. His review of systems and the review of his social history, uh, he had no joint GI, uh, GU, respiratory, skin, neurologic symptoms or signs and he denied any oral or genital ulcers. He uh, denied uh, having exposure to pets or animals, and he denied uh, intake of any uh, raw meat. Uh, for his uh, travel history, he had lived previously in Kuwait, uh, but no other pertinent travel history. Uh, his eye exam, uh, the right eye had a, a good vision of 2025. The left eye had decreased vision of 2060. His intraocular pressure was normal in both eyes. Uh, the right eye slit lamp exam was uh, essentially uh, normal with uh, no cells in the anterior chamber and a normal cornea. He had one plus nuclear sclerosis and his vitreous showed no cells. His left eye, the conjunctiva was white and the cornea was clear. He had trace cells in the anterior chamber. He had no transamination defect on the iris. He had a mild nuclear sclerosis. The vitreous, he had cells and one plus haze, and this is how uh, his posterior pole looked like. He had uh, the haze and uh, he had multiple lesions uh, that uh, were deep. We could see the retinal vessels go over them. And uh, this looked like a granuloma. Uh, and he had uh, the th these three other lesions. He had fluid, uh, also here sub uh, fovea fluid uh, uh, from these uh, lesions. 
On forcing angiography, uh, the lesions showed early hypofluorescence and uh, a late hyperfluorescence. And uh, we could see also uh, this uh, patchy vasculitis uh, close to the lesion. So this uh, is a unilateral posterior uveitis with a choroiditis uh, with the granuloma, that creamy lesion, uh, localized uh, vasculitis and vitriitis. Differential diagnosis, uh, I'm thinking at this point that this uh, is infectious um, um, uh, as a first uh, differential. And uh, in that differential, uh, TB is, is high with the uh, uh, choroidal granuloma. Toxocara is also on the differential, however, with the multiple lesions, uh, I wouldn't put it as number one. Uh, Triponema pallidum syphilis is, is always on the differential, so um, it is here as well. Bartonella might, might have uh, choroidal involvement and vasculitis, uh, however, there is no um, um, artery involvement and no occlusions, which sometimes we see with the uh, cat scratch and also the lack of uh, exposure to animals. Uh, toxoplasma, less likely, uh, obviously, because of the deep lesions. Uh, it's less of a ret it's a more of a choroidal lesion and less of a retinal lesion. So that's uh, less uh, on the differential. Sarcoidosis is on the differential, obviously, for non infectious, uh, uh, as a non infectious cause. Despite being in a, a unilateral uh, disease, uh, sarcoid could still be uh, on the differential here. So we have to rule that out. So uh, the investigation showed a highly positive uh, uh, skin TB test, PPD, more than 20 millimeters. And uh, the chest X-ray was negative. So with the impression of uh, presumed uh, ocular TB, uh, we started the patient on treatment for anti-TB drugs. And we followed the patient up in a month after he started treatment. And when we ascertained the response, then we continued the four drug therapy for two months and then followed by uh, two drug therapy for a total of seven months. And this is how he looked uh, at uh, two weeks, uh, at five week follow up and nine month follow up. Uh, you can see the improvement in the lesion at the uh, five week follow up and uh, here at the nine month follow up on uh, the fundus photo. You could see uh, uh, faintly the, the scars that are more apparent on the uh, fluorescein angiography. So that's uh, case one. Well, uh, that's a fantastic case. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. Um, and uh, so uh, is TB uh, common in Lebanon? Is it a common or like present in Lebanon? So, so Lebanon is not an endemic country for TB, but uh, um, as far as our uveitis uh, profile, uh, we see it uh, often. So uh, toxoplasma would be number one. I think uh, that's worldwide and also here with us. Uh, we see uh, herpes virus uh, and, uh, and the TB. Uh, it's, it's one of the top five we see definitely um, infections in the eye. Okay. Although it's not an endemic country. Uh -huh. And Rana, my second question again, uh, do you give steroids with TB treatment for the uh, Jerish Hexheimer reaction or only if you see an uh, only increase in inflammation? Only if, uh, only if the inflammation is, so uh, I usually don't, so if the patient is not on, because sometimes they already present to us on steroids, uh, but if the patient has not been on steroids, uh, because the issue is that we presume that they have ocular TB and um, the first uh, follow-up after one month of treatment is important to know if they responded to the treatment. This particular case, we didn't give steroids and they responded beautifully. Right. Uh, I typically consider giving steroids if I see that there, there are some elements that have improved after four weeks of anti or two to four weeks of anti-TB treatment, but some inflammatory elements are still prominent like uh, vitritis or, or, or vasculitis then I might add steroids, but I do not primarily add steroids unless the patient presented on the steroids uh, already. Just Thank because you. of the question of did they respond or not to my treatment. Sue? Um, 
Uh, sadly, the UK is now considered an endemic country and having worked in London for many years, we, we saw lots and lots of TB. Um, when, when I saw multifocal choroiditis like this, I, I would assume that this is miliary TB, not ocular TB, so it's coming through from the choroid, which has got a very high blood supply. <clears throat> and one of the problems with these is that um, we don't know where the primary is when the chest x-ray is uh, negative, so they may have spinal TB or they may have uh, uh, other uh, kidney TB or, or anything. Um, so we usually involve the physicians at this stage, but if somebody has a, a lesion threatening the, uh, the macula like this one was, and that his vision was already down, even if they've got miliary TB, you have a two week window when you can treat them with high dose steroids, because if you wait for all the TB investigations to come back, um, you often uh, lose the vision. So uh, you have a two week window before you need to start the anti-TB therapy, but when you do, uh, but you shouldn't wait longer than that because you could disseminate the TB further. So you're always uh, starting steroids in this case? Well, uh, in this case, she, I mean, they responded perfectly well without them. I think the worry is at the time that it may take a little while for the TB to, yeah. uh, to respond. Um, and, the, uh, uh, and, and the fluid may get worse because the granuloma may still be active. So um, in that situation, we probably would have given a steroid. You're better off giving oral steroids than intravenous or local or regional steroids because if it gets worse, you can stop them. You can stop it. Um, yeah. I mean, different ways of uh, skinning a cat. And uh, I think that's the beauty and the, the uh, interest in... Uh, from uveitis. Armando, would you, um, would you do something different in this case? Do you do different uh, in, treat, in giving steroids early or you wait if there's no response? Well, uh, TB is not endemic in Puerto Rico, so uh, our experience is quite limited. However, I usually don't do steroids, but I wouldn't hesitate to use them uh, if the situation arised where they would be needed. So yes. similar to what uh, Rola does. And uh, Rola, last question really. This patient had kidney surgery before, if I'm not correct, right? It was a kidney yes. surgery or just nephrolithiasis? So I had nephrolithiasis and a nephrectomy. So I had a nephrectomy. Uh, would you consider in the differential diagnosis as well, um, uh, Candida here because of the past, uh, recent past history of uh, surgery and probably antibiotics and the appearance of the lesions, would you be considering yeah. Candida in that presentation? So, so nephrectomy was was years years prior to oh, years back in remote history, so that wasn't wasn't recent. Um, so let's say that, let's say if it was recent, would you consider candida with that presentation or no? So uh, multifocal choroiditis and uh, vitritis. Well, the vitritis was was minimal. Mm -hmm. um, um, Doesn't and, look very typical. No, it doesn't look typical, and uh, probably I would I would expect the lesions to be more superficial. Right, right. Sue, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that we had um, several patients in whom uh, who had abnormal renal function for whether they had a nephrectomy and, and the second kidney was also a, a problem. If the uh, creatinine is raised, you have to be very careful with um, the isoniazid. And we've actually, we actually saw two cases of isoniazid optic neuropathy, which is irreversible um, in, in patients in whom the creatinine was rising and wasn't picked up by the physicians. So right. just when somebody has a renal history, you have to be really careful. Right. Yeah. Well, thank so, you so much. That's a fascinating discussion. Uh, Rola, if you uh, would like to move on with the second case, thank you. That's a beautiful case. Sure. So the second case is a 66-year-old male. Uh, he presented with blurring of vision in the left eye of one year duration. He denied any redness or pain. Uh, his past medical history was negative. Uh, he was reportedly healthy and um, on no medications. His system review was uh, negative. He denied any uh, signs or, or symptoms. Uh, he had no exposure to pets. Uh, he did report intake of, of raw meat. Uh, his vision on the right side was uh, normal and the uh, left vision was significantly decreased, counting finger at three meters. His slit lamp exam was pertinent for uh, small stellate keratic precipitates uh, 
on the corneal endothelium. He had two plus anterior chamber cells in both eyes. He had no APD and no transamination defects. Uh, his uh, lens were clear. Uh, the vitreous, he had cells in both eyes and he had haze on the left more than the right. He had one plus haze on the left. And on the right, he had uh, uh, more haze and he had uh, this uh, lesion here, a deep lesion, uh, uh, chorioretinal, I would say. And his fluorescein angiography, uh, this lesion uh, had late leakage. Uh, so he has bilateral uveitis. Uh, the left eye, he, ha he has chorioretinitis uh, with the anterior cells and the vitritis, and it's a bilateral uh, disease. So uh, under differential infections, uh, uh, syphilis and uh, TB, uh, we usually have uh, to rule these out uh, in these presentations. Uh, toxoplasma, uh, although uh, the retinal uh, involvement is less prominent, so I put it less on the differential. Uh, same thing with, uh, with herpes. This is a um, lesion in the posterior pole. The periphery uh, didn't have any lesions, so that uh, makes it less likely, but I, I put it in the differential. Uh, inflammatory uh, sarcoidosis on the differential, uh, but also serpiginous choroiditis, although the uh, Vitreous reaction is significant, but I put it there. And in terms of masquerade lymphoma on the differential. Uh, and uh, the workup did reveal a VDRL positive and uh, confirmed with the TPHA titer that was positive. And the patient uh, received treatment uh, with uh, intravenous penicillin. Uh, for the previous case and for this case, uh, with infectious uveitis, we usually um, I refer the patient for uh, our colleagues in the infectious disease department for uh, management and we follow up the, the findings in the eye. Uh, so uh, they did the uh, necessary lumbar puncture, which was negative, uh, and they gave him the treatment of penicillin. And on follow up, uh, uh, and on follow up, uh, there's improvement in the uh, in the haze and uh, and the uh, chorioretinal uh, uh, lesion uh, with decreased uh, with decreased uh, leakage. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, another beautiful case. Radios uh, syphilis. Uh, we see a lot of syphilis cases here in Arkansas. So we've seen all the presentations with the uh, placoid lesions as well as with vasculitis and retinitis. So it seems to be a problem. Was there any history of men having sex in men, with men in this patient? Or? He denied, he denied, he denied that. that. The patient denied that. Right. Yeah. right. Did, you test, uh, did you test for HIV? Um, because, yes. yes. Yeah, because when, when patients have quite a bit of vitritis, that's often a sign that HIV is associated, not always. But the two, the, the risk factors for HIV and syphilis are the same. So um, we always test the two. And exactly. one of the things that can happen when you start the when you start the penicillin is that the vision goes down and it can yeah. go crashing down because of, as uh, Ahmed mentioned previously, the yeah. reaction. So we're always, uh, uh, and what's interesting, it can happen in one eye much worse than the other one. And I would suspect that, you know, his left eye would be the one, if it was going to happen, it would happen. In. It doesn't happen in everybody. And I don't know the, how to predict but if patients have got a lot of uh, um, vitritis and retinal involvement, they're the ones that get it. And when you put, you have to put them on high dose steroids, um, which is why you need to know whether they're HIV positive or not. Um, and uh, the um, uh, and it goes, it settles down very quickly. Yeah. Well, I, what I do in these cases is uh, once again they get the HIV test and they go on their infection disease. I give them a forty milligram per day uh, course of steroids for two weeks and just stop it. So I don't taper it or anything. And I just give them two days after the start of treatment. I do this, I tend to do this routinely in syphilis patients. And because it's only a two weeks period, I just stop it. 
And uh, that milligram is enough to uh, to prevent the Jerish examiner? That's what I tend to do. It seems to work well, but I mean, uh, I think the argument is that if I haven't given them that, uh, would would it be needed or not? I, I tend to do the same as well for Toxo. I start with 40 milligram, but I start usually the same day. So that's the dose I tend to give them. Do you think it's a small dose? Um. Not with Tuxo, I, I do exactly the same. No, with syphilis, with, with, I mean, do you think syphilis, with syphilis, it's small dose? We don't, uh, we don't see syphilis a lot. Uh, yeah. I see it on every single patient, uveitis patient I, I, um, I have in the clinic, obviously, but uh, we rarely have it positive. Um, so uh, unlike you, I don't have a lot of patients with syphilis where I have to think, do I need to give them yeah. or not? But I'm wondering because of the, you know, the Jerus Eximer is usually... You know, an aggressive reaction, and uh, I'm just wondering if 40 would be would be enough. Or yeah, to... yeah, that's what I've been doing. I see them in a week and see how things are. Usually, they get better, but I mean, I think the argument is whether to give it or not. Sue, do you think it's 40 milligrams is a small dose? Or... Um, but, uh, well, it seems to work for you. Whether it prevents it happening <laughs> or, not, or just dampens it once it starts to happen, I don't know. Maybe if you start it right at the beginning, you don't need as much. I yeah. usually give 60, but uh, it, um, I don't think it really matters as long as it controls it. If you're seeing them in a week, you're going to, you can always put yeah, the dose. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I think just a tip here for uh, people hearing us, if you give a, a dose of steroids, even if it's a whacking dose, you can, as long as it's less than two weeks, you can stop. That's what they did in the optic nerve treatment trial. So you don't need to taper that down unless you need to. A question here about syphilis, do we need CSF analysis? What I found was infection disease, they keep to like, over, so sometimes they do CSF analysis and IV, and sometimes they go intramuscular. I think it depends really. Their argument is that the dose is gonna cover the, C the CNS infection anyway. But I think because of COVID, they have been doing re sometimes lumbar puncture, sometimes not. And I'm sure, and I think that was the case in England as well, Sue. Yeah, they, the, um, the, if they've got eye involvement, they're going to have secondary syphilis, unless they've got HIV infection, in which case they've got tertiary syphilis and the CSF is required. It's not required in somebody who's just got eye involvement. Yeah. That doesn't mean that the ID people won't do it, but it's not necessary because you, it's not a tertiary syphilis uh, when, the, when the, the uveitis presents. I think it also depends really where you work and how busy they are. And the argument is that, well, the dose of treatment covers anyway, CNS, syphilis, COVID as well have brought a, a different way of thinking about things. Um, any other, so we don't have any other questions from the audience. Uh, Armando, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, okay, would you be kind to share your screen? Oh, okay, of course. These are our audience, uh, any questions? Uh, we would love the discussion. We have time built in for the discussion. Okay, and for some reason I cannot start my video, but it's okay, I'll start it uh, like that. Okay, so uh, so thank you so much, Ahmed, for inviting me. I'm gonna be talking about uh, retinal vasculitis. Um, these are my financial disclosures. Today we're gonna be talking about two uh, simple cases, uh, and I quote, quote, simple of retinal vasculitis. Talk a little bit of the differential, the medical workup and the treatment algorithms. The first case is a 25-year-old Hispanic man who complained of floaters for three weeks. His referral diagnosis was intermediate uveitis. He had been treated with Durasol, which is a topical steroid, and Ketorolac, a topical NSAID, which led to the resolution of his symptoms. His past medical history was unremarkable. He had a family history of Takayasu's arteritis, which was interesting. Uh, social history, he had some social alcohol use, he denied any tobacco, illicit drugs, pets, or recent travel. In the review system, he had some atrologies, but was otherwise uh, unremarkable. On exam, his uncorrected vision was 20-20 in both eyes. He had normal tensions and normal slit line exam without any synechia. Uh, on the fundus, he had vitreous uh, snowballs, duplex cells, which were present anteriorly and posteriorly. This was normal, macula was flat. He had sheathing of the venules, which was present for 360 degrees in both eyes. And he had an area of ischemic retina, which measured approximately one this area present in furnasal to the disc in the right. I'm gonna show you now what he looked like. Uh, this is the fundus photographs. As you can see, this is a very subtle uh, retinal vasculitis. He, he did have his 
snowballs, but if you, if you look very carefully, you can see some sheathing, but it doesn't appear uh, as, as very uh, dense sheathing. However, when we do the angiogram, we see that he does have leakage in all of the venules in all four quadrants. And what was most concerning for me was the presence of this lesion in the nasal retina of the left eye, which was a little lesion of, of retinal ischemia. Uh, my concern here is that this qualified him as having ischemic vasculitis. And once you have ischemic vasculitis, uh, you, not only you can have uh, optic disc ischemia, you can also have macular ischemia or have a, a real vasculitis elsewhere in the body. This is his ICG, which uh, was pretty clean. He had no hypocyanescent lesions. There was one lesion in the right eye, which you can see inferior to the disc. However, that correlated to an old scar on, on the fundus picture. So that was not much concerning there. And he had a workup which had been done by the referral, referring physician. It was negative for syphilis. He came with a chest X-ray that was negative for sarcoidosis. He had some scoliosis. Uh, he had a brain MRI, which was a bit concerning because it showed a small focus of hyperintensity in T2 and flare images. Uh, and the radiologist thought that that could be either small vessel disease or it could be due to vasculitis. So if you think about it, this is a 25-year-old man who's healthy. So it's not the same thing when you're looking at the MRI of a 65 or 70-year-old, where you expect to see a small vessel disease. So, so we start thinking about the possibility of him having uh, some CNS vasculitis. Uh, his retina vasculitis was mild, so uh, it wouldn't surprise us to see mild CNS vasculitis as well. Uh, we ordered a hepatitis profile because one can see uh, peripheral retinal vasculitis with hepatitis B and C. However, uh, because if this man ended up have, needing uh, anti-TNF therapy, it was a nice thing to have. We also ordered quantiferin to rule out tuberculosis. It was negative. This was ordered by the referring physician. He got HLA typing done, which and it revealed that he was HLA B27 positive. This is, uh, I must note that HLA B27 is not a, an association for uh, retinal vasculitis per se, uh, but uh, this is what the HLA typing came back with. He was also HLA B35 positive, A30 and A68. So by default, he was HLA A29 negative and B51 negative. And as you all know, A29 is an HLA type that is associated with Burchett and B51 associated with Shed. So it uh, leads us against those two possibilities. Because of his HLA B27, uh, prior to my evaluation, he had been sent to a rheumatologist. Uh, he did a rheumatoid factor, which was negative. He did a spinal uh, MRI, which showed no evidence of sacroiliitis. However, a three-phase bone scan was positive for bilateral sacroiliitis. And his set rate and CRP were normal, which pointed against uh, major systemic involvement by vasculitis. So summarizing, we have a 25-year-old man with bilateral intermediate uveitis and ischemic retinal vasculitis. He had a family history of Takayasus. The MRI showed possible evidence of CNS vasculitis, and he was HLIB27 positive with a bone scan positive for sacroiliitis. He had no evidence of Burchard retinochoroiditis or Bichette's disease, and he was 2020. So what else did I want to order at this junction? Well, I got a, a gallium scan to make sure I was not missing any uh, sites of inflammation elsewhere in the body. I got ANCA, MPO, and PR3 because this could categorize uh, a vasculitis as something else. For example, if it was uh, CNCA positive, it would probably categorize him as, as, as GPA or GPA type. And it would probably influence the treatment that one would give to the patient. Uh, instead of anti-TNF, if the patient was ANCA positive, one may consider rituximab, for example. We ordered an ANA test, uh, Lyme antibody, uh, Borrelia, and we, it's, if he was uh, likely to end up uh, needing prednisone, we also got baseline labs such as uh, chemistry, um, blood count, glycosylated hemoglobin, urinalysis, and lipids. Um, the workup was normal. So the plan was to start him on prednisone, one milligram per kilogram. We don't like to exceed 60 because that renders him at a risk of vascular necrosis of bone. And we sought insurance approval for Humira, but we didn't start Humira right away. Uh, two weeks 
Later, the patient returned for follow-up, and lo and behold, uh, using 60 milligrams of prednisone per day, his vasculitis was absolutely quiet. So we start tapering down the prednisone. We do this in a very standardized fashion because uh, it's not the same to have a flare up at the level of 50 milligrams per day versus 12.5. If a patient is being tapered in a standard fashion, if, if you flare at a higher dose, you might need more immunosuppression than you flare at the lower dose. And because we thought he might have acute disease, we want to give him a kid which is a chance, we follow a quick taper and we try to have him go all the way down to zero. Um, one month after the complete discontinuation of steroid, he, his fluorescein angiogram showed that he did have as active vasculitis. Uh, since the activity was occurred less than three months after discontinuation, disqualified him as having chronic disease. So this time we restarted the prednisone, but added Humira, which is adalimumab. Uh, we started the prednisone taper. This time we followed the chronic path, which uh, is done by tapering one milligram per month once we reach a 10 milligram dose. And uh, 10 months after presentation, he was still quiet, 2020. He's still on Umira, 40 milligrams every two weeks, and we have been able to taper his brightness and all the way down to five milligrams. This was last week, and he's doing well. So this is uh, the end of the first case. Questions? Um, I think there was a question, really, which uh, Sue has replied to, uh, Professor Leiden has replied to, but maybe didn't go to everyone, but again, it would be good mm -hmm. to share it. Uh, the question is, uh, can you give uh, anti-TNF to patients with suspected MS, uh, particularly Humira? Oh, definitely. What do you think, Armando, on that? That's a big contraindication. So this patient in particular, we sent him to a neurologist prior to considering anti-TNF, and the neurologist said that his lesion was unlikely to be MS-related. But definitely, we try to avoid it because it can cause a big flare. Right. So... Uh, so, um, again, maybe the point to, um, if you can elaborate further uh, uh, on Armando, is that how you, okay, thinking of this retinal vasculitis, what would make you think actually the other way that this is an infectious uh, retinal vasculitis? So if you have a case of retinal vasculitis, mm -hmm. uh, tell me the things that would make you think actually this might be infectious and I need to be cautious here. Well, uh pretty much the workup. Uh, of course, he didn't have any fever or any other systemic uh, uh, symptoms uh, suggestive of infectious disease, but his chest x-ray was negative and he had a negative quantiferon TB gold and uh, uh, a negative uh, syphilis test. So those are the most common issues. Of course, it could be some other rare disease, but one has to think that 90% uh, of all uveitis is, is, uh, is autoimmune. So if we round up the usual suspects and we rule them out, then we're less in a situation where statistically it is much less likely to be infectious. And we went ahead and treating him as, as autoimmune. Also, we're in a non-endemic area for tuberculosis in, in Puerto Rico. So common things common. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I think the main one, which is really a worry, and if you have any clues for that, is uh, patients presenting with bilateral vasculitis and areas of retinitis. And the question really is this uh, infectious mm -hmm. retinitis, mainly herpetic, just being like oh, bilateral, sure. a barn mm -hmm. or a Bechet disease. Have you encountered that situation before and uh, what to do? Well, um it didn't appear as, as retinitis per se, right? At this junction, it, right. it was it was more like a, it appeared more like a capillary dropout. It was hard to look. It appeared more like a Bechet type lesion when right. we, one looked at it clinically, and that's what led me to use anti TNF because even though he denied mouth ulcers or genital ulcers and he was HLA we took fifty one negative. It looked as the thing that Bechet's could do in the retina, and we all know that's a very bad disease, and we know that anti-TNF is what one would optimally would like to give a patient with Bechet's. So this is why I, I the, the patient's mother is also a physician, so when we, we all talked, and the other thing is that before starting anti-TNF, I also did a trial of prednisone. Right. And he got better on the prednisone. So if he yeah. gets, so after two weeks of prednisone, he's, 
it looks beautiful, it's most likely autoimmune rather than infectious at that junction. So then after that, we went ahead and started the anti -TNF. So uh, So to sum up, maybe like if the vasculitis is treated with other lesions, you need to be just careful. Like of course, or definitely. Lesions. And yes. also uh, uh, it's good to test the water with oral steroids and see what's mm -hmm. happening in the first two weeks. Definitely. Um, maybe the same question to just Sue quickly. So if you have a patient who looks like Bechet but has areas of retinitis, which you can get with Bechet and vasculitis and his both eyes, would you be worried and do an AC tap or a vitreous tap for acute retinal necrosis or you would treat and just watch carefully in the first week or so? I think the, the retinitis in Bechet tends to be more around the, um, you know, isn't in the far periphery. Right. Uh, which what uh, mm -hmm. happens with acute retinal necrosis. If you're ever, ever concerned that you might have a patient with acute retinal necrosis, because the um, lesions can move fast and why you sort out the investigations and everything is to just put them on some oral valacyclovir because it's an mm -hmm. oral drug. You don't need to admit the patient. It quickly controls it and you can always stop it. Um, so if you think, if you're worried about peripheral retinitis, while you sort do the investigations and for peripheral retinitis, I pro unless the vision was 6-6, six, six, mm -hmm. um, I would do a vitreous tap, but for 6-6, for six, six, I, I probably wouldn't. Um, but I'd go through all the rest of the investigations first. And if I'm, if I'm sure, then I'll stop it. Right. Yes. And another thing is that ARN is a very fast disease. I tell my patients, you look at the patient, if two days later he looks different and the retinitis has progressed, then that could be herpes. This patient actually... Uh, be, I, I didn't start the prednisone until I did all that gallium scan and all those other, uh, the, the TB and the syphilis testing. And that took like a week to complete. So uh, I saw him and then I saw him a week later. And one week later, there was no change or no progression of any retinitis. So that let me, you know, that leads you against. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, these are yeah. all excellent points. Rola, I'm sure you see lots of Besh uh, in Lebanon. Anything to add to the discussion? So. And uh... Uh, no, I think uh, it's been covered, but uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, I agree that um, uh, with the uh, virus uh, part that, uh, uh, you know, after a week, uh, if, he's, uh, if it hasn't progressed, uh, then we're not thinking of it. And uh, Bashat is a clinical diagnosis. If he denies exactly. the genital ulcers mm -hmm. and he denied uh, everything else, then we, uh, we cannot think that this is Bashat. Although I, I, I do agree that sometimes the presentation would make us think, especially if you have occlusive, uh, occlusive vasculitis, even if they deny all the other systemic uh, symptoms, you would, I would do exactly what Armando said, uh, did is uh, uh, to be on the safe side, start them on anti-TNF, uh, just in case this is the, uh, uh, first, the first presenting uh, finding of Bechet because uh, we do have patients who present uh, first with uh, uh, ocular findings and uh, then sometimes years, la years later they have these uh, uh, relentless uh, uh, oral ulcers or gentle ulcers. So, um, um, so I would probably do the same, um, I want to put the patient on uh, anti-TNF um, if I'm suspicious that this could be uh, just ocular findings similar to Bashat, even if they don't have the systemic, uh, all the systemic findings. Fantastic. Uh, well, that's fantastic discussion, Rian. I think the, all the, the cases mm -hmm. are fantastic and the grit, nitty gritty bits are in the discussion, Rian. Uh, Armando, thanks. Can, can you move on with the second case? Yes. Uh, let me see. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is case number two. And uh, very interesting case. I, I get a text message from one of my colleagues at the university. These are the actual images that he texted me. And he said, hey, Armando, I have a 42-year-old female. She has a history of bilateral optic disc swelling. She has retinal vasculitis in both eyes. She has CME in the left eye. And the neuro-ophthalmologist couldn't figure out what it is. So I look at this images that he sent me on the, on the cell phone. And I said, send her over. I think I know what it is. Well, we have a 42-year-old Hispanic woman who complained of flashes and floaters for three months. The, di the feral diagnosis was bilateral retinal vasculitis, CME, and this swelling. The past medical history was unremarkable. The family history was non-contributory. She had a social history of, of alcohol use, no tobacco, illicit drugs, pets, or recent travels. And the reveal systems was absolutely unremarkable. 
Her best corrective vision was 2025 in both eyes. The pressure was 15 mil, uh, normal. The slit line was normal, no synechia. She had mild swelling and she had multifocal ovoid hypopigmented lesions in both eyes. She had no retinitis. She did have CME in both eyes. She had sheathing of the venules for 360 degrees in both eyes. And she did have two plus feature cells with no snowbanks and no uh, snowballs. This is what her fundus looked like. As you can see, she had multiple hypopigmented uh, choroidal lesions in both eyes. They were more centered around the disc. However, they were also present in the mid periphery. I did a fluorescein angiogram, which did reveal this branching pattern of vasculitis in both eyes. The ICG revealed multiple hypocyanescent lesions uh, present in both eyes throughout the, the posterior pole in the mid periphery. And the OCT did reveal that she did have uh, CME in both eyes. Thus far, so we have a 42 year old, uh, previously healthy woman complaining of flashes and floaters for three months. She had a history of bilateral optic swelling, retinal vasculitis, and CME. On exam, she was 2025. She had multiple ovoid hypopigmented choroidal lesions. The fluorescein angiogram showed branching vasculitis, and the ICG showed multiple hypocyanescent spots in both eyes. She had CME. So what did we order? We ordered an FDA-ABS to rule out syphilis, quantiferin TB gold to rule out tuberculosis, a chest X-ray to rule out sarcoidosis, and HLA-829 to rule out Bershaw retinochoroiditis. So lo and behold, she was HLA-829 uh, positive. Everything else was negative, which rendered her as having a diagnosis of birdshot. Um, a word on the treatment of birdshot retinochoroiditis. Uh, these patients need to be started on systemic immunosuppression right from the, the moment that they're diagnosed. Uh, they, they become blind in two ways. They, they either suffer a visual field loss, a peripheral visual field loss, which is centripetal. It goes from the periphery to the posterior uh, pole. And that may not be prevented with prednisone only. It is prevented and oftentimes reversed when we give them immunosuppressant broth steroids. The same thing happens with chronic, uh, with CME. It not all, uh, immunosuppressors not only prevent the CME, but it also helps prevent the, the recurrence of CME in these patients if they have it. Uh, I must recall that the first patient with birth that I ever saw, I was in, in Louisiana, and the patient oh, was from... Sorry for the we are two, my four, four o'clock, four oh, fifteen. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry for that, I apologize. Yeah, Don't worry. But before we get ready for school... Okay. Sorry, Armando, give me one second. I apologize okay. for that. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, okay, I muted all. Okay. Yeah. So the first patient uh, that I ever saw with Bershaw, she was crippled up in a weird chair and she was uh, finger counting spline in both eyes. Uh, the problem with her was she was in Louisiana and she was from Alabama, and Alabama did not cover immunosuppressors uh, on free care. So she didn't have the means of buying immunosuppressors, so she went blind. So it's, even though we see patients with good visual acuities, this is a potentially blinding disease. So back to our patient, this is a brief summary of the treatment course. I started her on CELSEP, which is mycophenolate mofetil, 1.5 grams twice daily, and prednisone, uh, 60 milligrams daily. One few months later, she was still active despite the high dose prednisone, and she did have CME in both eyes. So I decided to do an intravitreal induction with uh, preservative free time cinolone, which is branded as triessence by Alcon. A month after the intravitreal time cinolone, she was finally inactive, and I aimed to taper her from 60 milligrams of prednisone to 7.5. Uh, upon tapering to 20 milligrams, uh, she developed a, a flare with a CME in both eyes. So we added Neural, uh, which is cyclosporine A, 2 milligrams per kilogram twice daily. We reinduced her with Triumph Cinolone in both eyes and, um, and once again gave her prednisone 60, which we tapered to, aim to taper to 7.5 milligrams. She did not tolerate neural, so at this junction we added Humira. 20 months into treatment, uh, she finally started Humira plus uh, Celsa plus prednisone, and she continued to have flares of her disease with, the, with uh, CME, and these flares occur upon tapering the prednisone at eight milligrams or below. 
Uh, months later, she developed a series of capsular cataracts. Her vision dropped to 2100 and, and the right eye and 2400 in the left eye, and she could no longer drive to work. So she had uh, limitations of her activities of daily living. So in order to prepare her for cataract surgery, we increased the prednisone to 20, we increased it to 60 and, and, uh, and tapered it to 20, which is those where she was known to be quiet. So we kept her uh, 20 milligrams of prednisone plus Celsep and Humira, uh, for three months in preparation to surgery, because we want to make sure that if you have patients that have at least three months of quiescence prior to surgery. In addition to that, two days before surgery, we increased the prednisone back to 60 milligrams daily. On the day of surgery, we gave her methylprednisolone, 125 milligrams IV prior to the incision. Two days after surgery, we increased, uh, we kept the prednisone at 60. We kept her topical corticosteroids hourly until the anterior chamber was quiet. And then we tapered the prednisone back to baseline, lowering the dose every two days, which is what we call a quick taper. So to make the long story short, 27 months after presentation, she was back to 2020 in both eyes. She relocated to Boston, Massachusetts. She continues to batter with her birdshot. The next thing I knew, she was being considered for the uh, supracoroidal steroid uh, treatment trial. So that's the end of the case. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Armando. That's a fantastic case of uh, bird shot. Armando, can I ask you, do you get ERG routinely on these patients and visual fields for in your practice? Sorry, I do apologize. Let me just mute you. Hey, okay, perfect. Now I, good. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get ERG every now and then, but the, the truth is uh, I, I don't, I get visual fields. I get a 64 and I got a 10-2 and I, I do monitor them with visual fields more than ERG. I find that the variation in ERG, you know, unless it's really advanced, is it's so low that it's a bit cumbersome, but every now and then I get them. It's not something I, more for research purposes than anything else. So you more follow them with visual field. And yes, and, and fluorescence and ICGs, I, I find that more valuable. Yes. Let me see any questions from the um, audience. Sorry. Good, okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Uh, let's check the chat for questions. Uh, Emira, Bursha, Retina, the right. 2020. Okay. Um, may, Armando, maybe a last question from me. I'm trying to sort out and get back to the participants. Um, is there anything in the appearance of what you think is like a bird shot that makes you, that uh, would make you think that this could be a lymphoma on the long term? And there are some uh, of the virtual that were found later on to be lymphoma. Oh yes, uh, definitely. Uh, to tell you the truth, the, the young age uh, and the HLA-29 uh, serology, uh, a, a haplotype pointed more towards virtual. But of course, if this was an older person, I would probably have gotten an MRI. And if, the, and if she was HLA-29 negative, that would have also pointed me uh, otherwise. Nice. Yes. Yeah. And also the reason I start Celsip rather than other than, than Humira straight from the get-go, although I know people that start them on Humira straight from the beginning. Yeah. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, Sue, are you ready to share your screen? I'm sorry, I'll uh, unmute you. Yeah. Manage participants. Okay. Uh, so if you can start sharing your screen, I'll unmute you in a second. I'm sorry for this. I'll get your video. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Sue. Let me try again.
Okay, you're unmuted now. All right. Yes, I'm. I'm yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't do anything because you were controlling. No. I, I was just no. going to add to the. Um, I couldn't get in because uh, you'd uh, you you cut you uh, kept me uh, out. But the. Um, sorry. What, uh, what I was going to say was that we use color vision as well because that's very useful. I must right. say I do find the ERGs very useful, but when you do an ERG every, you do need to make sure the patient hasn't got macular edema first because it seems to, it just alters it completely. And uh, so if patients are having intermittent macular edema, then uh, ERG is not quite so useful, but uh, for people who are dry, it's very useful. And also for choroidal new vascular membrane, if you have an eye with a choroidal new vascular membrane, you have to take this in account really, and yes. that will contribute to the ERG changes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I have, uh, I have two cases. So this is the first one. This isn't the lady herself, but this is a, a picture of her uh, of a similar age lady. She's 32 years old and she presents with a three month history of floaters in both eyes. She has no past medical history. She has a healthy baby delivered 12 months ago. No medications, normal systems review, and she's completely well in herself. She has no headaches, no night sweats, no travel. So on examination, she's 6'6 in both eyes. She has a few cells in both anterior chambers. She has massive amounts of vitreous cells in both eyes. There's a poor view of the fundus because of this, but the optic discs and maculae look normal. And you could just about get an OCT and there's no macular edema there. The investigations were done and I then started her on 60 milligrams of prednisone daily. So I saw her two weeks later when I would have expected the steroids to be doing something. All the investigations that I did, her chest X-ray, serum ACE, antinuclear factor, VDRL, QGO were all negative. Her vision was still 6-6 in both eyes. There was no improvement at all in the clinical signs. So the plan was to wait another four weeks. So I put her down to 30 milligrams of prednisone for two weeks and then 20 milligrams daily for two weeks and then to review because some patients just need a little bit longer. So there was no change clinically four weeks later. Her vision remained good at 6.6 and her really only sign was of dense vitritis in both eyes. So when people don't respond, when patients don't respond to the treatment you've given them, you have to think again, consider the diagnosis. There was nothing to suggest an infective cause. Um, the investigations were all negative. If this was an inflammatory cause, it should have responded by now. So we need to exclude malignancy, even though she's young. So the plan was to reduce the prednisone dose rapidly and stop all the steroids over the next two weeks. And then to do a vitreous biopsy two weeks after the steroids are stopped. And the, um, uh, you can't do a vitreous biopsy while they're on the steroids because steroids can kill off the cells and make the diagnosis even more difficult to make. So this lady showed a very, the vitreous biopsy, which was a standard vitreous biopsy, um, showed a high level of CD19 lymphocytes, confirming a diffuse large cell lymphoma. And you can see here lots of PAS positive uh, lymphocytes and then staining with the CD19 positive cells. So having got that diagnosis, a tissue diagnosis, uh, we did an MRI of head and orbits and there was no concurrent primary central nervous system lymphoma that we could detect. So there is no one way of treating these patients. Uh, Niki Rothova got a group of us together to look at um, how our different oncology units treated these patients and they were all, uh, all very different. But our, our uh, oncologist gave ocular irradiation with prophylactic central nervous system treatment and ocular radiation gets rid of the cells really quickly. In combination with systemic chemotherapy to control the um, uh, everything um, and to prevent CNS involvement and the um, because CNS involvement may be microbitastases, uh, they're not all visible on MRI scan. But she had a good response to treatment but the eyes relapsed so we gave her intravitreal methotrexate um, and, that, uh, uh, and that controls it. So our primary treatment is ocular irradiation. And then if they um, relapse, we give them intravitreal methotrexate. Of course, 
there are other things that develop. If you give uh, irradiate the whole eye, which you need to do if the vitreous is involved, they get cataracts. You can't shield the lens. Um, she had already got AC cells. Um, so we had to take cataracts out, um, but her vision uh, did very well with that. Um, and they do get dry eyes uh, and also the radiation. Uh, they need some topical steroid while they're having the radiation. And the good thing is she's still alive four years later. So what are the learning points in this situation? Intraocular lymphoma may masquerade as a uveitis. It's the classic masquerade. It can be a primary CNS or, or it can be a cystic, systemic lymphoma. But systemic lymphoma usually has choroidal lesions. So you can see here, this is a systemic lymphoma. And you can see that these lesions are deep. They're in the choroid. It's usually people greater than 60 years old presenting with uveitis for the first time. But that's no longer, the, no longer a good guide. In these people, you must think about it. In all of the others, you need to, to think about it. But it's less likely, but it still can happen. And the key sign here is the better vision that you would expect from these findings on examination. For example, 6-6 with dense vitritis. Macular edema is very uncommon. Remember, her vision was 6-6 throughout all of this. And one of the things sometimes when you look into the uh, vitreous, you may see um, cells of all different sizes. Uh, and when you do that, that also makes you think that this might be a lymphoma. Certainly began to see more of these type of leopard spotting um, and ring lesions um, with uh, um, around in the, uh, with, uh, in the retina with the leopard spotting where there's been fluid and it's settling. Um, and so you just need to be very aware that, uh, uh, macular, that um, primary intraocular lymphoma can occur uh, in, uh, in the younger patient and be very wary about patients who uh, don't respond to the treatment that you give them and who um, have signs that don't add up. Dense vitritis usually will give you macular edema and will, will drop your vision. So just go back. Uh, so are there any questions about this case? Um, so just one point, can you make your slide uh, bigger? We can see your, your slide smaller. I, I think it's one of these two there at the bottom where you hovered over, I think. Uh, more. Maybe don't worry if it's going to mess things up. I wouldn't worry. <laughs> we still can see them very nicely. No. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't work out how to do that. Don't worry, don't worry. I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry. Okay, is anybody, any other questions about this case? Yes, have you seen uh, T-cell lymphomas before? We had a patient that presented very much like retinitis in her 70s. Yes. And uh, we treated her, or we worked her up for ARN and for viral and toxo and PCRs came back negative. She, we thought still might be toxo, but she did not respond to anti-toxo treatment. And then we did a vitrectomy and a, a bigger vitreous biopsy ended up being T-cell lymphoma. Yeah, I've seen two types yeah. of T-cell lymphoma. So T-cell lymphoma classically presents um, with skin lesions. Yes. A patient with skin lesions that are odd, that may or not may, I think it's called sarcosis or something like that. If they present with that, um, if they've got skin lesions and they've got lesions in the eye, this is T-cell lymphoma until proven otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so we would do a biopsy in that. The other thing I've seen, a T-cell lymphoma of the tonsil um, go, to the, go to the eye and patient presented with a hypopian. Um, and uh, the thing that was odd was that the pressure was 60. And uh, it's because the um, malignant cells were infiltrating into the trabecular work and everywhere. Um, and so the eye was white with a pressure of 60 and this hypopian, um, which is always make you think, you know, a pressure of 60 doesn't normally give you a white eye. And, um, uh, the, um, and this was a thing. So, I, so T cell lymphoma definitely, but it's much less common. People also say that Hodgkin's lymphoma doesn't go to the eye. Yes, it does. It's just much less common than B cell lymphoma. Yeah, my, my case was just an isolated ocular then later on two years presented with CNS lymphoma. She didn't have any systemic fungoids or any other systemic involvement. And, and she did so well with uh, methotrexate, but then she died after two and a half years. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question about the dose of methotrexate, as I recall from memory, it's 400 microgram. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. It's 400 micrograms, and there are different regimes you can use. The one I usually use is that I irradiate first, then uh, if they relapse, I give them one intraocular methotrexate injection, and then I wait, because in quite a lot of patients, one will last them for months. Right. If other people do it every two weeks or every yeah. weekly or a month, and so there are different You end up like 25 injections in the first year. That's what we did. Yeah, so um, I don't use it as primary treatment. Um, I use the irradiation for that. Yeah, and rituximab as well has been used for uh, B-cell lymphomas as well. It has, yes. And uh, so I have no experience of uh, um, intraocular rituximab, but certainly uh, anecdotal reports are coming out about it. Rola, you've used uh, rituximab intravitrum in, in, um, in uh, non-infectious uveitis, right? Uh, I've uh, I've used it for uh, lymphoma, B cell lymphoma. For lymphoma, I'm sorry, you used uh, Humira, right? You used intravitreal yes. Humira. No, no, no. I think you did a study That's on this. Yeah, not for. What was the end? Uh, not, do you still use not. intravitreal Humira or no? Uh, In I, I, do. Uh, I do use it. Uh, I'm currently ran randomizing um, a study to compare subcutaneous to intravitreal. Right. Uh, with, uh, slightly, slightly more than halfway. Uh, through the study. And uh, I use it uh, sometimes for, for a breakthrough inflammation if a patient yes. is on, uh, is on uh, Humira and um, they get a breakthrough inflammation and, uh, and uh, that particular patient, um, we, we can't use the steroids uh, um, locally or, or systemically, um, then, then I use it and uh, it helps. Um, and you, you did not see any uh, severe panuveitis as was seen with intravitreal infliximab before? No, no, no right. I haven't seen that. Uh, there are cases who uh, have uh, recurrence of the inflammation on uh, treatment, similar to systemic treatment. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen a reaction to the injection itself, uh, meaning uh, aggressive uh, reaction okay. or inflammation happening after the injection with uh, Adenimo map now. Right, thank you so much. Uh, Sue, some questions here for you, uh, Professor Lightman. Uh, so are any, um, anything in the FA and ICG you think is like important to pinpoint lymphoma versus other uh, UVI uveitis? No, no. Yeah. Uh, any systemic investigation? I mean, you work them, you do MRI, lumbar puncture, I know, and then uh, if you're suspecting systemic or as part of their workup, they will also get like worked up for systemic lymphoma. Is that correct? Yeah. You get the oncologist to do that, so they will do a systemic review, and they will also do um, uh, uh, bone marrows and things like that. But we don't do that; we just pass them over. Right, and then uh, uh, there's question here uh, about uh, if we have vitritis with 20 vision with no response for steroid, uh, do we think about lymphoma even in young patients? Well, yes, that's what this case shows. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, always keep it at the back of your mind. And as uh, Professor Lightman has been saying, uh, if, uh, if you're thinking this is inflammation and you've excluded infection, but then the patient is not responding, then there is something really not correct here. And um, before you embark on immunomodulation therapy or anything down the route of non-infectious uveitis, you need to stop and think because if the patient is not responding to systemic steroid, there is something unusual happening here and it could be masquerade. Um, okay, uh, Professor Lightman, if you can uh, kindly proceed with your second case. Okay, so this is a 54-year-old lady presents to the A&E department with pain and photophobia in her left eye for the last 24 hours. She has no previous eye history and is on no drops. Her corrected vision in the right eye is 6.6 and left eye is 6.9 minus with no improvement with a pinhole. The right eye has occasional cell in it in the anterior chamber, but there are one plus cells in the left eye. The pressures are 15 millimeters of mercury on the right and 11 millimeters of mercury on the left. She's given dexamethasone drops four times a day for the left eye, decreasing by one drop per week for four weeks and to come back again if the eye does not settle. She presents actually a week later as the eye has not settled. 
division six nine minus in the corrected six nine minus in the right eye, six sixty in the left eye, no improvement with the pinhole. She has more AC cells. There's a bigger pressure difference. Both eyes are down and there's three millimeters of pressure difference. So she has a, the investigation she should have had done when she first presented. She's dilated in both eyes and she has uh, vitritis on the right eye, in the right eye and worse in the left eye. And this is the fundus appearance. So you can see here these uh, um, pearls and these large choroid lesions. This is very characteristic of candida endothermitis. So um, in both eyes. So what's happened? So when you take a further history from this patient, the patient had gallbladder surgery three weeks before. He developed a, she developed a bile leak and went to intensive care unit and was discharged 10 days before her first visit to A&E. So the most likely diagnosis is candida endothermitis. And she's most likely got it from infection of the intravenous long lines, giving intravenous therapy in intensive care unit. Um, because if they've been, she's been in there for sort of uh, uh, more than a week, they don't just use ordinary lines. And later on, it's revealed that this long line catheter tip grew candida, but as the patient had already left ITU, nothing was done about it. This case actually is a medico legal case. Um, I'm, I never saw this patient, um, I'm happy to say, um, but uh, the, this case has come to court um, and the patient got a great deal of money for it. We'll go back over the signs in a minute, but just let me um, let me just think about. Let me just go back. So, uh, if you, uh, I mean, we got uh, some maybe uh, way for getting the full slide. If you press on those three dots, yeah, there, and then uh, they say uh, duplicate. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> To do anything <laughs> we don't want to lose you let's continue <laughs> <laughs> okay so if we, if we go back um to the first slide i mean the error the, the, there are very basic errors in this uh, in this person's examination first of all the two eye visions are different and that makes you think what's going on you know, she's got problems in her left eye the vision is not as good it doesn't pinhole up she's got ac cells she's got a big pressure difference pressure difference always makes you think that there's something that should not write in a patient's eye if the pressure is lower. Um, patient's not dilated. This is a this is a, you know sort of year one errors. This patient should have been dilated at this stage, um, and you don't just give um, drops in this situation um, without uh, asking patients a lot more questions uh, and uh, um, and uh, and examining the back of the eye. Now, there's some criteria for anterior uveitis are that there are cells in the AC and can be in the anterior vitreous, but that it's a diagnosis of exclusion because you have to have excluded that there's anything else going on in the back of the eye. So the uh, chances are that this was already uh, active. And by the time she came back to this stage, obviously, this vision is a lot worse. And you can see, you can see these lesions here. So when you're thinking about any patient with uveitis, it's not one disease. All the word means is that there are cells in the eye. It doesn't tell you anything else. It doesn't tell you whether these are good cells, bad cells, whether they're going to cause havoc, whether they're not going to cause havoc, whether they're because of an infection, inflammation or whatever. And as Ahmed said, this was the mantra that I, I drum into all my fellows. And I've got, I noticed that Ahmed, uh, another Ahmed's also on this, uh, um, and he will, he will have this engraved on his brain, um, is that you have to think about every case you see, inflammatory causes, infective causes, malignant causes. And then if you always think like that, then you put them in the order which you think that um, is most likely for that patient. But if patients aren't, uh, if things don't look right, then you have to go through these and, and, you know, it may take more than one visit to sort them out. And as this case shows, <coughs> excuse me, you must always take a full past medical history. Patients often think that what's happened to the rest of them is of no relevance to the eye, so they don't mention it. And we've all been there. Uh, patients, I, I had another case um, in, when I was on call one night, 
patient came in with a, a, a hypopion in one eye and he says, absolutely fine. This guy had an enormous abscess on his, uh, on his chest and he's from his sternoclavicular joint. Um, and, but he said, oh, well, it's nothing to do with you, doc. It's, it, it, I just want my eyes sorted out. And he'd point out, well, actually they might be connected. Um, and we always need to uh, be aware of that. And you really have to go back and make a patient. Of course, patients don't always tell us the truth. And that's uh, as we, uh, all of us who've seen syphilis will know that patients deny everything until you uh, face them with the tests. And even then they're very surprised. And then you always dilate the patient on presentation because it's only anterior uveitis if the posterior segment is clear. So you mustn't make the diagnosis without that. And if the vision changes, then you dilate the patient again because something else has happened. Um, and now they may have got macular edema or there may be other lesions. So you have to be very careful. And I present this case because um, I say this one ended up in the, uh, in the courts and it's very difficult to defend it, to defend this uh, ophthalmologist because actually they've broken all the rules. Um, so much as I tried not to be um, too difficult, um, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's very hard to, to, uh, to not say, well, actually put your hand up, this, this is wrong. You shouldn't do that. So masquerade is really infective and malignant causes. Inflammatory causes is what everybody thinks about, but these are also um, very important. Okay, I hope that was useful. Thank you. That's, uh, that's very useful. Thank you so much, Sue. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, do we have any, uh, okay. Uh, do we have any questions to Professor Leibman from the audience or? Um, chat questions here. I, I think they're all uh, like uh, gre greetings and uh, <laughs> thank you. So that's, uh, that's good. Also some uh, tips of how to get the full presentation, but I'm sorry. Uh, how do you treat? Okay, I think there's a question about treatment of the last case. I mean, this is a case that Professor Leibman did not see. I think she was involved probably as, a, but, but, as an um, expert witness, but how will you treat the fungal endophthalmitis in general, Sue? Yeah, well, you, you've, you're an expert on this, Ahmed. We've read a lot of it. But <laughs> right. basically, once, in the, once it's in the vitreous, patient needs a vitrectomy because um, the scaff of this, uh, even if you um, sterilize it by putting in, giving them voriconazole uh, or, or fluconazole and putting amphotericin in, the, the vitreous will contract and it'll pull the retina off. So this eye was the one we did first. Um, and uh, or was done first. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see this case, but this is the one that had the first surgery. This one's more difficult because um, obviously there's choroidal lesions as well. Um, and then there's this vitreous lesion. So in fact, this patient was, was given um, fluconazole, um, intraocular amphotericin into this eye, same with this eye, uh, but had surgery in this eye. Um, and then actually this one settled. Uh, the vision was never going to improve because the macula is essentially taken out. Um, and, uh, and the retina sort of, um, it just uh, calmed down. So we didn't need to do a vitrectomy in this eye, but in this one we did. Right, fantastic. And use, uh, I mean, voriconazole is expensive in many areas of the world. Do you, what do you think about fluconazole, especially if you're thinking it's more likely to be candida? Yeah, fluconazole is definitely the one to start with. It penetrates well um, and uh, you get a good level, uh, get a good MRC in the eye. Uh, in patients coming from ITU, um, uh, particularly candida paracelosis, um, you have to be very careful because they're often fluconazole resistant, um, in which case voriconazole is the next uh, one. Um, voriconazole can be used uh, intravitreally as well as systemically, but remember these patients often have uh, systemic lesions as well. In the AIDS patients who were found to have fungal endophthalmitis, 86% of them had other, other organs involved. So, uh, you know, you have to be, you can treat the eyes, but the patients actually do require systemic treatment. Right. Well, thank you so much, Sue. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, I just want to have one last case to show. I'll show it quickly. It shouldn't be long. And, uh, and then uh, that would, uh, would be it. <laughs> Unless there are other questions. Right. This is an, a case, I think I have the same, sorry.
Is my screen splitted or seems as <laughs> okay? Uh, so this is a 60 year old patient present with decreased vision referred from a retina specialist uh, because of the uh, decreased vision counting fingers in the right eye and uh, left eye is 2020 or still 66 and he's happy with it. He is on several medications, but nothing, none of them was like the standout as an immunosuppressant or a uveitis, a medication that is strongly related, uh, connected with uveitis. Uh, apart from AC cells, one plus in the right eye, there was nothing that we could see. And uh, this is the posterior segment appearance. And here, this is the appearance in the right eye. And this is the uh, close up appearance of the right eye. And this is the appearance in the left eye. And a close up appearance in the left eye with some very fine, uh, deep mottling there and some areas of vasculitis you can see inferiorly. Uh, autofluorescence right eye and autofluorescence uh, left eye. And this is the fluorescein angiogram here of the right eye. You got these linear lesions as long, uh, along the vessels as well in the macula and the optic nerve. And uh, later pictures. And this is the ICG where you get this areas of hypocyanescence, rounded areas of hypocyanescence. And this is his other eye, again, with areas of patchy vasculitis, uh, very few linear lesions and some uh, small leakage from the disc and the macula and the ICG as well. here. And this is his macular appearance in the uh, right and in the left, uh, not significant changes. So the question again, this is uh, again the same question and the same points that uh, all of us mentioned on infectious inflammation, neoplastic. Sometimes there, there's like phenotypical appearance that make uh, that would make you think, oh, that's this. And in this case, I was thinking this is a linear chorioretinitis along the vessels. So could this be a West Nile uh, uh, vial, a West, Nile, West Nile fever because of uh, the way the chorioretinitis but the patient was really well himself, no neurological issues, no ICU admission or anything. So then uh, thinking, is this infection and what shall I do? Uh, so again, I, I think here is the same re, uh, way of thinking, infection, inflammation, new plastics. So we got blood tests, we got lots of blood tests. Uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, we got lots of uh, blood tests. Uh, we had and most of, nearly all of them were normal T-spot syphilis. And we also got West Nile uh, virus, IgG and IgM, although actually there was no, uh, any significant systemic association. So again, here, uh, although you were thinking this could be an infection, but you don't know, you've excluded most of them. So we gave the patient uh, systemic steroids and then saw the patient in the first week and the patient got better. So you can see here that things are settling down, his vitritis is settling down and his areas of vasculitis are starting to heal. And then continued him on systemic steroid tapering down to a small dose of five milligram. And then uh, he was sent back to his retina specialist. And I know that the patient uh, did well and did not relapse. Just my point is that we again emphasize the same points, infectious inflammation, uh, new plastic and also what to do with the management. Systemic steroid is the safest way initially, at least to test the water uh, until you know what you're dealing with. And thank you so much. Right, any, uh, stop share. Any, any, final, any final points from the, uh, can we get, I, I don't think we have, um, uh, I can see a bit uh, questions. Uh, yeah, this is a case here. Uh, so maybe a case for all the panel really, a 16 year old patient with deteriorated vision, counting fingered, counting fingers, dense vitritis and large submacular yellow lesion. Uh, we started on topical steroid. So I, I think maybe the question is a patient with vitritis, a dense uh, yellow macular lesions through the vitritis and decreased vision. And maybe that's similar to 
a case that uh, Roller presented. So we're dealing with vitritis and a macular lesion and uh, decreased vision. I think that, again, the main concern would be infection. And probably most of us would treat this patient as the infection first. So what would you do in this scenario? So you have a vitritis. You cannot see anything. You can see a macular lesion there, maybe from the dense vitritis. Uh, well, and that's what you see, and everything else is negative. Yeah, so what I do is, uh, I, I, these patients, I start on high-dose steroids and I cover for everything. So I may right. put them on back, back trim uh, for, <laughs> because toxoserology takes a week to come back. Um, syphilis serology, actually you can wait, uh, providing the three or four days to, to get it. Um, and the other thing I do is I put, often put them on val acyclovir um, to make sure that uh, I'm not missing something further out in the periphery. And then as you, as you I do a vitreous tap and uh, get the PCR done, and then I'll have, by the end of the week, I'll have, uh, I'll have excluded, whether it's Soster or Simplex, I can stop the valet cyclovir. The toxo bloods may have come back positive or negative, and you can um, uh, alter the therapy from that. So that's the way I do it. Yeah. So I think the, the point that Sue's trying to emphasize is think infection in this scenario, especially a new uveitis, uh, unilateral, and then, uh, cover for that, uh, and then uh, everything can wait except viral, right? Exactly. And maybe toxo can wait uh, a little bit, but not too long, and syphilis can wait. Usually here we get syphilis serology in a couple of hours, which is really, we're lucky. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Mm. Yes. Um, when <laughs> I want to do, cover, want to yes, uh, in those sort of cases, when I want to cover, what I do is I start a monocytromycin, uh, which covers very nicely uh, toxo, um, toxo, toxoplasma as well as uh, Bartonella henselii. And uh, I also might do some doxycycline and also uh, antivirals, uh, uh, valacyclovir. So I, I do very similar as Professor Lightman does. And, and then only then when I get a definitely diagnosis, definite diagnosis, I would start steroids. And uh, Rolla, anything else to add on this case? Yes. I'm sorry, I'll try to unmute you. Okay, here you go. So you have a dense, you have a case with presenting with vitritis and you can see a macular lesion there okay. through the vitreous. Would you be thinking that you want to cover for infection first and how would you yes, do it? Definitely. And um, I typically wait a couple of days for the uh, TB uh, test to come out before I start uh, the steroids. So I don't right. start the steroids in this case immediately exactly. before they leave the clinic. And, you know, even if you're doing PPD, it's 48 hours. I, I wait for that uh, before. And then if it is negative, uh, just because of the concern that what if um, they have also systemic uh, or, or pulmonary, um, although the patient might not have symptoms. Uh, but I, I'm usually uh, cautious not to start steroids before I check that. But we do know that uh, if patients got TB, you won't do them any harm inside two weeks. The infectious diseases uh, doctors are very happy for us to do that. Um, the, um, so th what, what's going to help you with it, clear this vitritis is steroids. Um, and because you know, it may be inflammatory, there may be a, you know, a, an inflammatory lesion there. And as long as you're covering for the other things, um, then I haven't run into problems with this. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, otherwise you're faced with a situation three days later when you still don't, you've still got the same clinical signs there. So mm -hmm. I, I start them all, cover them with the drugs and then get them back the following week with the, with the blood tests. That's um, uh, again, so I think different ways for doing things and that's the beauty in UVI. Yes. But I think maybe we can take from that the one thing that you really need to cover for, uh, especially if you're going to be not treating the patients or you're going to be treating with steroid is viral number one and maybe toxo number two and then uh, syphilis and tb so treatment can wait a little bit uh for these spec even with uh, with with steroids i think that's something to know but always cover for uh viral maybe it's uh, if it's in the posterior pool and this is an immunocompetent patient it's unlikely to be viral although actually we're reporting two cases that we saw of uh, viral retinitis presenting like porn in immunocompetent patients. So viral retinitis in the macula mainly, and the patient is immunocompetent and on viral PCR, these patients actually were uh, herpetic. So it seems it's a spectrum between ARN and porn. Sue, have you ever seen something like this before? I think I asked Rola before about this. 
Yes, no, well, corn you have to be very careful with because it doesn't necessarily have much detritus and also it'll blind you in 48 hours. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a white lesion at the macula and somebody who's, uh, you have to be very immunosuppressed to get corn. That being, that being said, I've actually seen corn in a patient who we did the HIV and everything else about 10 times and it was negative. Yeah, and we have yes. two cases like this actually, very interesting, two cases. Yeah. And uh, but the vast majority are very immunosuppressed, and you have to be so careful with yeah. these patients. You mustn't, if you think porn, you mustn't do a vitreous tap because you'll, you'll, the, the retina will fall apart um, because it's uh, it's like Swiss cheese anyway. So you can do an AC tap. Yeah. Um, virus. That's a. Uh... Right. Uh, and uh, should I start treatment with stock? So I think that was Professor Leitman was saying in her experience that what she uh, used and still doing, she would uh, cover the patient with antitoxodex spectrum or septrin and uh, valacyclovir. And uh, do you cover, you, and you wait for syphilis, right, Sue, or you? Yes, um, I, can get to, I can get syphilis back in three days. It did once take three weeks. And they actually said, oh, we're, we're, we're expediting this. We're, we're ringing you up. And I said, if I right. waited I, <laughs> the patient would have been completely mm -hmm. blind. Um, <laughs> right. yeah, you, you, you do need to, um, you do, but three days is uh, seemed to be fine. And the physicians were happy with that. And then once we got the the tests uh, and the HIV test can be done very rapidly if the syphilis is positive. Right. Okay, and maybe a final question here from Dr. Noha Osama. How do you, uh, what's the most specific for lymphoma? Is it MRI, brain, or vitreous biopsy? It's vitreous biopsy. The most specific is vitreous biopsy. And the problem is sometimes the vitreous biopsy may be negative. You may need to go for coliretinal biopsy. We know that vitrectomy biopsy is better than needle biopsy in these cases. You need to go, um, all right, I think we're about to finish. If we can have a final word of wisdom, maybe for uh, from every participant, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Sue. Uh, any final word of wisdom? Yes, we, you know, don't don't delay starting drugs when patients are, are losing vision, because the worst thing you can do is to wait for all the tests to come back. You have to use your clinical judgment in this situation, and as we've just discussed, start the steroids, cover them with what you uh, with what the differential is. It's not what it is; it's what it could be until you've got the results back, and that's the way that's the way I, I function and how I teach. And so we cover them with really everything, and then gradually withdraw uh, medication. Thank you, and Armando. Well, uh, following the words of uh, Professor Lightman, I have a saying that I, that is uh, to, to my residents in my over 20 years as a UBI specialist, I haven't seen a patient go blind because lack of, of a diagnosis, but I've seen many go blind because lack of treatment. So just as she said, treat your patients and, and make sure you cover for whatever is common in your, in your country, in your area. Yes. Right. And uh, Dr. Rola Hammam from uh, Beirut. Uh, I would say um, whenever things are not, uh, if, if you're uh, treating, you have a diagnosis or uh, most likely a diagnosis and you're treating and the patient is not responding the way they should, you have to stop and think, maybe I got this wrong and uh, ask the patient again about um, the review of systems and look again at the case and check, is this a masquerade? Is this an infection that I've missed? Um, so always, you know, I have the courage to stop and say, maybe I have, I got it wrong and I have to think all over again about this case. Right. And for me, I actually wanted to say what Rola just said. So uh, I will just uh, second uh, all what she said now. And that's uh, was, uh, what Professor used, Leitner used to say, or re remains to say that it's all about the infectious inflammation, neoplastic. Maybe, I mean, if you diagnose sarcoid, it's not going to be much difference really in the treatment from another non-infectious mm -hmm. uveitis. It's mainly you want to know which group. And maybe just a final answer for Dr. Salem uh, here about fungal vitritis. When do you do vitrectomy? Uh, usually if there's complication also for the diagnosis, we did a, I did a study with Sue and we found that actually it does not improve the vision if you do a vitrectomy for these patients, but it decreases the incidence of uh, late onset retinal detachment and the need for a later vitrectomy. Uh, but go ahead and start treatment early in these cases, fungal uh, vitritis, especially that these patients may, if they are addicts, they may not come back for more treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, well, thank you so much all. And this was a great session. I've definitely learned a lot and I really appreciate your time.
and uh, your attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ahmed, for inviting us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. And bye. Thank you for our audience. Bye bye. And thank you for the Afro Asian Council. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.